Can you Hi. hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. My microphones have been giving me such trouble lately. Oh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you, my dear? Good. Thanks for uh, willing to do this. Well, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> so I could just uh, jump around before getting to Fire Emblem. Sure. So the first thing I can ask is, um, what was the job that uh, got you into SAG? Oh my gosh. Uh, I did background on movies. I uh, did background work on Gangster Squad and Super 8. And okay. uh, I met I met a lot of the PAs that worked on there. And one in particular gave me a lot of advice of how to do background work for a movie because I'd never done it before. And I was able to get my SAG vouchers through that. So I bought into SAG before the big merger with AFTRA. Because okay. if you were in, you could just buy your way into AFTRA back in the day. And if, of course, if any of us knew, but, but I got in right before the merge. So early on, there was some uh, on-camera aspiration then, opposed to voiceover? A little bit, yeah. I, I had thought maybe, is this something I could do? Is this something I want to do? And I'm still very open to that. But for voiceover, it's such a focused career. Like, you don't, you don't really dabble in voiceover unless you truly just kind of want to goof around. But I wanted it to be a career, so I had to put all my time and resources and focus on voiceover. And now that I've now that I feel I've made it a steady, consistent career for me, where I'm comfortable where I am and I'm I'm good with all the ups and downs, now I could look into TV and film if that's something I want to do. But I'm still I'm still not sure. You know, it's 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 scary starting something from the ground up. Yeah. You know, when when you've worked so hard on something else and like you're not gonna sacrifice that, but to start something brand new from the ground up, it's scary. Well, in terms of a uh dubbing was um playing Ratsuko's mom the first experience you had with that um with with anime or yeah it was my first anime yes I had done um a couple brief Walla characters on Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and I worked with Patrick Seitz who was the casting and vocal director for Gretzko we worked together on Thundercats Roar for a year because hmm. uh, he was he was a main character in the show and I popped in for about nine episodes as different characters it was such a fun show those records are some of my absolute favorites mm -hmm. and i got to know patrick then and he had said do you do anime and i said i'm trying <laughs> it's a, it's a hard genre to break into so he was working on a Gretzko and we were getting ready to do season two and so he had me audition for the mother and she started off kind of very very like cartman's mom but because like I'm not a mom what does a mom say and it's just well be yourself but here's your annoying child do you have any nieces in your life or nephews or kids in your life that you care for often enough where it's like come on guys you got to listen to me where there and once I learned that it helped tap in much easier so that that's how Retzko's mom came to be and considering um your experience in voiceover that uh so far did you take the dubbing easier or was it still hard to get used to Dubbing was, dub, I, got, I took to that pretty easily because uh, you, you have your three beeps and then you hop right in where you're supposed to speak. We usually watch the scenes of whatever you're dubbing first. And I always read the line. And then in my mind, as I'm watching them speak in the other language, I'll say the line in my head to see, make sure it matches up with the lip flaps the way I would say it. And if I say it too slow or too quick, I'll kind of like see that initially. And then we'll do a take or two before we nail it. <laughs> And is there a special story of how you first got, got involved with the Fire Emblem franchise or was it kind of a general audition? Uh, it was it was a general audition, I believe, um, for the producing house. And I had I knew of the game. I'm not a big gamer, which feels like a sin to say, but I definitely knew of the game. And I had popped in for a couple other Fire Emblem characters, uh, Laram and Mamori, and they were fun to do. And then Chloe came along and she was just, I loved how she'll eat anything because that right. was me in my twenties. I will eat anything. I'll try anything new. I'm more refined now, but she, she had me right away by saying like, Oh, do you want to eat some of these fried eyeballs? They're so delicious. Go on, try some. Okay. More for me. <laughs> and then, she, you know, the divine one is just like the fairy tales. She, there's this prince or princess that's come out of a book. And so, this is her chance to like, oh, I can be a part of that. I love when you're sleeping. It's so peaceful. <laughs> so she she's that fun fangirl, but not mm -hmm. like, 
not like dangerous. No, no, definitely not dangerous. Were you also just um auto cast for Chloe? You know, I don't actually know. I'd have to I'd have to check with our production team, like because some characters can be autocast if you know their archetypes, you know their voice types, you you know the type of character they can achieve at, and does it match the character? And it was my first time working on a game of this magnitude, uh, and these kind of JRPGs. Mm -hmm. So if it was kind of an autocast, I'm very grateful for that because it it showed they have that trust in you to bring a character to life without too extensive knowledge of the character because we we don't learn about our characters or our character arcs until we're recording in the session for safety's sake, like yeah. automatic NDAs. And um, which aspects of Chloe could you relate the most to? Besides the eating and the, the falling in love with everybody, I also love how she, you know, to maintain that beautiful vision she has of the future or her present, she's willing to do anything, especially with Saline. She's her main protector, I think. Again, it's been a while, but... Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot of the clips on Twitter, like different video clips of her, her fights and her cut scenes. And it's, I just remember like, oh, she was so much fun. She, she has such a high hope for the future and she wants to believe in that better tomorrow that that's what gets her through the next day. Yeah, there were, um, I know you've seen it too. There were so many people that were excited that you finally uh, announced like yeah. <laughs> the characters. <laughs> well, and I, there, I was... A lot of it was like, you know, are you the right fit for these sort of things? I had someone tell me a long time ago, like, oh, you don't have the vocal type to do anime or JRPGs. Um, I, re I recommend just staying to Western animation. And it really had hurt my feelings a lot because I didn't think there was a type for either of those styles of animation or those genres of animation. But I do understand there is a feeling you get when you're watching anime and you hear those performances there's a certain it factor that you hear in these shows. And I believe, I believe I've got it somewhere because Agretzko is such a well-casted show. It's well-directed. Patrick did a phenomenal job on that show. And not just like the direction we took, but the way they translated it or transcribed it. So we've, we've modernized, whoops, we've modernized so many of the things they say. You watch in Japanese with the subtitles and then you play the English track. And it's been kind of updated and adapted for our audiences. And I like that. I like where they throw in Ton's daughters that they're saying, like, we're going to help you. It's like bonding and junk. And, like, they clearly didn't say that in the Japanese language, but that's how American teens 20 years ago spoke. So I, re I really liked that aspect. So I really felt like, hey, I achieved something. I'm part of this world. It's believable. I'd love to do more of it. And then... You know, doing these games, I was worried, like, well, what if I don't come off well? Or what if it's a big slap in the face? Because the fans are so passionate about these games and about these types of characters. So it's like, well, I'll just, maybe I shouldn't say it's me. And then I realized how well-loved she was. And people were like, this is really great work. You just stand by what you do and love it just as much as they love it. And you, you may not please everybody, but if you're happy with yourself, that's all that matters. So I thought, okay, I want to take that leap and really put my focus in in this direction right now do you uh tend to consume very much of the media that you also star in i do it's probably very narcissistic but i really like to watch my own work um some things i will skip if i know like this is a heavy scene or th this isn't something i was maybe comfortable with at the time if we didn't know what we were recording at the time which is a lot better now because back in the day you you weren't told much of your games, like your video games, or where's the direction of this TV show going to go? And there are certain things I won't do, but if it gets close to that line, I kind of hem and haw. Or some of my earlier work, it's hard to watch because you grow. You won't see your own growth, but the stuff I did in 2013 versus now, like, oh, there's a big difference. Um, and my very first project was Mr. Pickles for Adult Swim. And that one was really fun. We we just did whatever our instincts told us to do. And the showrunners, they had a very valid way of running that show. We would do a read or two of what we think it is. And then they would give us line reads of the direction they're thinking of, which I think is helpful personally. Like if you have a specific vision, tell me what that vision is. Tell me how you're hearing it. And let me recreate that sound for you to achieve your goal. 
Some actors may not like that if it's like, well, this is what I need to internalize and give you. That's why you hired me. Yes. But if they have a specific sound they want to hear or a direction they want you to take, give a couple takes of that. And then they can look in post, which was the stronger option, which one worked better, which one worked exactly how we wanted it. It's part of that collaboration. What do you think um, in general? What do you think the case is where you've had to alter your voice the most significantly for anything? Oh, a lot of that was on Thundercats Roar. Because we, um, oh, there were so many fun characters. Because th there was Gwen, the unicorn, who was very much like the Farrah Fawcett unicorn in the last unicorn. And the weirdest one was this character called Eclipsor. Um, and he was, he was like a, it was a, like a robotic, non gendered entity that's like, I'm going to steal all the power from your planet and you can't stop me. And so he sounded something like this, where it was robotic, but not quite. And it was, it was definitely walking a tightrope, maintaining that voice. And it had to scream. It had to do some weird stuff. And we had a brief moment there where, like, we should have saved the screams for last. That's on, that's on me for not saying anything. But that episode turned out really well. Or um, Mrs. Gristini, I really loved her. She's an older woman who spends her day off with her cat, which is Snarf. But she's not really a little old lady at all. I won't spoil it, but you should watch the episode, darling. It's fantastic. What about, a? Uh, I don't know if there's been too many cases with this, but have you had to go to any, like, really dark head spaces for voiceover? Not yet. Um, those types of places... It's usually in um, heavy, drum dramatic video games or maybe really dark animation that you find like on Netflix or HBO Max if you have to recreate traumatic events. And they have their place in those genres. It's, ju it's just definitely good. Hey, let the actor know this is kind of where they might be heading. Be prepared for that. If I know in advance there's trauma of a certain nature or if there's children that are in distress or in dangerous situations... I might stay away because I'm very aurally sensitive. So hearing those types of characters in that type of pain or that fear, it can be very visceral for me. So I might avoid working on those projects or, or watching those projects if I know it's going to affect me. It doesn't mean it shouldn't exist because there's a place for everything in these genres. I just don't find the entertainment value in it for myself. So I stay away from them. Give me the happy ending stuff. Give me the funny slapstick stuff. Or give me the dark comedies where the darkness is leveled by brevity. And you'll find that in Harley Quinn. Um, not so much Blood of Zeus, but Blood of Zeus has wonderful acting. So, you know, you take, you take your chances with the media you consume. And if it's not right for you, just turn it off. But if it is, follow through and see what kind of new discoveries you can make with what you like. So uh, back to Chloe, it does seem as though it's pretty close to your natural voice. She's pretty close, yeah. I've got the morning voice, so it's not exactly here right now. But when we did Chloe, she just always had a smile on her voice. And she, it's, it's that princess that she always wishes she could be, and maybe one day she will. So I, I like putting her in that soft princess space because it reenacts what her dream is. But then when she fights... She gets more leveled and more hardcore about it. Was there any um, reference to, to the Japanese at all or no? We had some references to kind of hear her style. And she had a lower voice in the, in our, in the Japanese uh, VA. It was a lower voice, but she still had that soft affectation on her voice, which I really liked. So I, was, I, I figured if I bring that over and bring over the smile and the youth of what this character is, it should translate fairly well. I think it did. And there, there are also... some characters, well, I, I, I've heard the Japanese reference for other characters, and then you hear the English, and it may be complete opposites in terms of pitch, but it'll still fit the character if you've got the right acting behind it, if you've got the right inflection, because a, a voice can come from any face. It, it's real easy to think like, okay, this is what the character looks like. In theory, this is what she'll sound like. But if you have a different voice coming out, it challenges that ca that uh, typecasting. And then you you learn to like, oh, it could it's an anyone voice. Anyone could be this character. You can project on that character while you play. This could be you. And that that's kind of new that I've noticed in a lot of our dubbing casting projects. And I think it's wonderful. It does seem like too that uh the other characters and Fire Emblem Heroes are pretty close to your natural voice. 
too. They're pretty, they're pretty close. They, they might change it pitch wise for youth or if there's a brassy aspect or a sultry aspect. It, it just depends on like the, the layer you add onto it. Always start with your regular voice and then see what are her characteristics. What does she like to do? Does she have a short fuse, a long fuse? Is she, you know, once you kind of learn those specs of her, then you can add layers to your voice that fit those specs on top of your natural voice. Do you have a, from what you can remember, what you've seen, do you have a favorite character interaction with Chloe? Ooh, was it? There's one where she, she's, they're traveling. It's been so long and she, she comes out of nowhere, I think. And she's got a plate of like food, some type of folk food. And they're like, where did you get that? I'm like, there was a food stall in that back alley over there. You should really check it out. They've got all kinds of things. And I'm like, girl, you're going into back alleys and you come out with food. Is this really food? It just, I, there's, we did so many of them and I'm hoping to see more clips <laughs> on Twitter of more people playing the games. Cause, cause I want to remember like, Oh, what was it? Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I love now that I'm seeing them, I love seeing the other characters reactions to her. Because we sometimes we'll have the other characters' performance ready to go off of. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we'll see some of the script. Sometimes we won't. But now that I'm seeing their reactions to her, it makes me laugh so much. And I think my favorite is the one where, you know, oh, if waking up to me is so startling, let's put a bed in your chamber for me, and then you won't be so startled. And they're like, nope, not doing that. <laughs> oh. And both the male and female reactions, they're both make me laugh so much. <laughs> That was the first one I saw. One of the uh, favorite ones I have is with Seedal, which is the uh, long-haired um, dancer. Mm -hmm. And then he's he's telling her about how ways that he can uh, have something to make him more vigorous when he's dancing. And then she brings up uh, like fi fish eggs cooked in sugar or something like that. <laughs> yes. It's eggs cooked in sugar. Yeah. And she caught a fish somewhere. And they're like, do you even know what's in that? Do you know what you're putting in your body? No. I just know it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> and the way she'll just say the love and devotion she says to all these food items. Yeah. That's my favorite part because I'll see so many people saying like, oh, God, why? How does that sound good? And like, in, in any folk food or any culture you go to, there's a passion thing they love there how many how many people think like you eat french fries from that place do you know what they put in it no it's a potato i'm happy with that mm -hmm. and that's me i'll eat any potato <laughs> <laughs> have you uh gotten the game not yet um i don't again i'm not a gamer which is shameful because i i do video games i should be playing these games my roommate's a gamer though so when he when he gets uh games that i'm familiar with or i'll watch him play or if i have time which is not often i'll try to see like okay are there playthroughs on youtube or people who play the game and you can kind of watch it or they'll sometimes post like basically a movie of the game and they'll do the gameplay super quick to kind of get through it because that type of gameplay it's enjoyed if you're the one doing it but if you're watching it, it's like, okay, kind of get rid of all the enemies and get to the next cutscene. And then watch, I watch the cutscenes as a movie. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I'm, I like it with the gameplay involved because it's like if you jump from cutscene to cutscene, like, well, how did I, how did we get here? Was there anything important? Okay, well, here, they really defeat the villains here. They got the magic ring. Okay, now continue. So I like doing that. That way I'm familiar with it. So I've been watching the cutscenes of The Last of Us um before each episode of the tv show because i'm really into that right now and people i know who've played the game they said like yeah we played the game 10 years ago this is this is a faithful adaptation there's enhancements for different characters or different paths for different characters that weren't in the game that are really nice to see for today's audience but they've said like it's very faithful so what you're watching is like 95 percent the game so i'll watch the cut scenes before or after to kind of marry the two and it's such a good game. I can see what the hype is. There were some people that were wondering, um, I'm not sure if it's easy to remember specifically, but um, the different conversations that Chloe has with the actual emblems. 
if you have any that stand out. I I remember we had them. It's I don't really remember too much. I I I remember working with another character because that character was voiced by a friend of mine, and I recognized their voice. And I text them like, "Excuse me, did you do this?" Like maybe. Okay, well, have fun when you go in for more of that character. Okay, winky emoji. <laughs> um, so I love hearing all my peers' voices as well, but I'm I'm not too familiar with the previous Emblem games. Mm -hmm. what makes an emblem but i was aware like hey this is a big deal these characters are coming over from another game these are the heroes these are the stories so i remember those aspects of it but it, it my memory's not good and when after we record that's kind of it like that was it for the day we don't come back to it but that means when the game comes out it's fresh for you and like i'll remember as i'm watching but even if i could i can't really say exactly what we did because you you want to make sure you're experiencing that firsthand yourself so are you friends with very many people in the cast? I am. Now that I know who's in the cast, I'm like, oh, I know all these people. This is great. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of people I know of who are big names in the anime world and the video game world. So I definitely know of them. And I'd love to meet them myself one day. It, it just kind of like, how do, the, how do the stars line up? Are we at a convention together? That's how I met Eric Vale. I met him at a convention we did together. And he's delightful. Um, and a lot of the other voices I already knew from doing Western animation or we would do workshops or clinics together as we were crafting our, our careers. And I still take classes and workshops to this day. It's, it's a little bit less since it's all virtual right now. I really like the in-person stuff, so I hope we go back to in-person. But I still take classes to practice archetypes that I don't book often to see what, what could be something that isn't clicking. Is it too cartoony versus realism? And then having these other people there, I get to see their creative process as well if the class is for everyone to view instead of like one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. And I met Kira. Oh my gosh, she's going to kill me. Erica Harlicker. It should be Erica. Um, we did a script reading recently uh, for a project and she was so good. And I knew of her and I finally got to meet her. And she was delightful. I'm sure it's Erica Harlecker. Oh, she's going to kill me if it's not. <laughs> oh, but I, I enjoyed her so much. And so I really love meeting all these other people that I've heard of or I've watched their work or getting to meet your heroes, but your peers as well. And I, I think that holds so much more weight because you're meeting on an equal footing. There's no unequal footing there. So, well, speaking of, that, a, yeah. Well, speaking of a vocal arc, archetypes, um, do you do a lot of boy voices? Yes, I've uh, Miss, uh, Tommy on Mr. Pickles. He was kind of like, he's a young voice. He's like six years old and he's up over here and he talks all the time. <laughs> or there's uh, like younger boys that are like preteen or maybe sort of teen, but you know, it's not too, it's not dropped fully yet. It's just kind of there. Or maybe they're stoners at the way I'm doing it. Um. I don't know if this is a boy voice. I haven't really used this one much yet. It's more of a 50-year-old smoker. But that's kind of the range of boy voices, so it's a little limited. But some of the girls out there, they sound just like boys. Like perfect casting. Is there a child in that room? I don't know. No, it's Nikki Breyer. No, it's Georgia Kidder. No, it's Terry Douglas. It's just perfect boy voices. Have you gotten the opportunity to um, perform with yourself yet? How do you mean? Like two characters talking to each other or something like that? Oh, yes. Um, I, I've, ha I've definitely had some uh, characters on like Mickey Mouse Funhouse that talk to Minnie, so we'll talk to each other. Uh, I have, there have been some projects that I haven't booked because if, if the two characters are talking together, they may sound just a hair similar or like mm -hmm. a really trained ear could tell, oh, it's the same actress. So you have to make sure they're significantly different in order to make it work and I, pr I pride myself on the most part that if it's if it's for our fun disney shows you know minnie sits very comfortably up here and any other character should be sitting here or lower that way and never the two shall meet and so there, there have been some fun stuff for that that i've been able to do outside <laughs> projects not too many if, if you can do more than one character on your show that's always a boon uh, for yourself as well as the team but 
they really do try to get as many actors in for unique roles as possible. There's work, for, there's enough room for everybody. So definitely cast the right talent where you find it. Not just like, well, oh, one person can do three voices for cutting costs. Make sure they're the right talent for that voice. One, one more aspect of Chloe we didn't touch on yet. What are your thoughts on her design when you saw it for the first time? She's so cute. The hair, the eyes, the outfit. They, I, I've seen people like, that's not a, that's not a good outfit for her to wear. She's a knight. Why is her tummy exposed? And like, if you're going to fight injustice, you got to be fashionable. And she knows what she's doing. It's hot out there. You know, <laughs> very true to life. She's very statuesque. Um, I, I love her design. And the, the artwork I've seen of her is just beautiful. And, and that color palette, I think, catches a lot of people's eyes, too. You don't often see those colors out there. Those teal or kind of darker green, darker blue. That caught my eye. It could only be better if she were all purple. What kind of uh, comments have you gotten from fans since you made that post? A lot of them were like, oh, so it's you. Okay. I didn't know that the woman who does these voices is Chloe. And some of them are like, this is a weird mix. And then they spiral down the rabbit hole of like, oh, you did Mr. Pickles as well. Oh, you were on. You were on Amphibia. You were do like when they find out other stuff I've done. It, it's been fun to see like that reaction because it it's it's self satisfying of okay I have range, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> and they're pleased with the work. That's the biggest. You know we all want to be loved. I hope I'm doing good work. Um, but I just I I loved seeing the the fan reaction from it of okay it's it's out there here here I am hope I do well and then I'm seeing all the clips of it and like yeah I think I'm doing pretty well. And I love their reactions to it as well. Cause either she's like everyone's waifu or they're like, Chloe, what the hell? Why are you a stalker? Why are you eating it? It's, it's, it's one or the other, but I'll take the waifu. I'm everyone's waifu. Yeah. Well, is there anything that you want to say to the uh, Fire Emblem community? Oh goodness. Thank you so much for playing the game, everyone. And I hope to see all of you inside one of my fairy tales. <laughs> <laughs> So is there anything else that's uh, upcoming or part of you can safely talk about? Mm. Goodness. Uh, not really. Like everything is NDA until it airs or premieres. So I've got, I've got some fun stuff coming down the line later this year and next year. It, but it'll basically be like, check my social medias and I'll post like the day something drops to give that, to give that announcement. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's so hard to say because there's nothing that's been put out there yet where it kind of credits a cast list. Because once it credits you as a cast list, that does open some doors. But we still usually wait until the actual project drops before we talk about it. Mm -hmm. That way people can immediately rush to find a way to consume that media to see what it's all about. Well, my final question then is always asking, uh, what do you want your legacy to be? I want my legacy to be somebody who made people laugh. Like my, my heroes growing up were always like Maurice LaMarche, uh, Tress McNeil, Rusie Taylor, um, of course, June Foray. But like I had kind of the second generation of voice actors after June. That was what I grew up with. And seeing like how legendary they are and how they're still working today, they're still performing that longevity and that, that comforting feeling of like, oh, in a way, these people are represent home. Because if, you, if you've grown up with them, like you're comforted by their work, you can always go back and watch that work. You can see what new stuff is coming out or what reboots are coming out to bring back that nostalgia. And in a crazy world, we need that nostalgia sometimes. So I want to be someone like them where I have that long lasting impression of an actor who entertained you, who made you laugh, who made you cry, or who just made you happy. And that can inspire them to pay it forward to someone else. I want to give to people who watch my work the same feelings I got watching my heroes work. I want to pay it forward in that way. Well, thank you. I'm glad that we got to do this. Oh, of course. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good rest of your day then. You too, my dear. Take care. Bye.